called Caveman Prayers. I'm going to say Caveman Amen. Prayers. We began the series last week, and we're going to continue this this week and next week. And we're looking at some. We're looking uh, at a moment in David's life. And you remember last week we talked about King David. And uh, one thing that sets David apart from every other character in the Bible, I think, uh, actually, this 100% sets him apart, is not only in David's life do we get to see him from the time he's you know, 13, 14 years old being anointed by the prophet Samuel, and we get to see him all through the days of his life. We get to see him, we get to see him rise from being a shepherd in the fields to the king of Israel to the most beloved man and one of the most famous men throughout all the world. And we get to see his ups and downs, his shortcomings, his flaws, and all of it. We get a huge sample of his life. Uh, but, but because he was a poet, because he was a musician, because he was a psalmist and he wrote many of the psalms, not only do we get to see David's outer life and the stuff that happened, but we, we get a rare glimpse, and I don't know of any other Bible character that we get this much in, info on, but we, get, we actually get in day, through the psalms, we can see inside of David's inner life. We can, see, we can see the prayers that he prayed. We can see the thoughts that he had. We can see what was the inner dialogue that he had as he's walking through the journey, the steps of his life. And so we're taking a few weeks and we're digging in, we're looking at one particular moment in David's life where he is not yet king. Uh, king Saul has actually put a hit on him. He's, put, he's got a bounty on his head. King Saul is trying to kill him because he recognizes God's blessing on him. And David is now being forced to live in the wilderness and to live in caves and to hide out from King Saul while King Saul and his men and other people throughout the land are trying to kill him. And so this is David has, David has already killed Goliath. David has been anointed king. David understands his calling. And yet he finds himself in a cave. And we talked about last week, and I want you to just remind you here, just remember when you're in a cave season, when you're in a low season, just because you look up and find yourself in a cave doesn't mean you're not called anymore. Just because you find yourself in a lonely place just because you find yourself in a desert place doesn't mean God's hand has been removed from your life. Doesn't mean God has changed his mind about you. Just because you're in a cave doesn't mean you're not called. The cave isn't there to kill your calling. Amen, somebody. Today we're going to look at Psalm chapter 142. And uh, we looked at Psalm 63 last week, which is... Which is the, credited as a prayer of David in the cave. This is another one, Psalm 142, that says a psalm of David regarding his experience in the cave. But many scholars believe that this particular psalm is probably the psalm, one of the probably psalms or one of the prayers, one of the things that David said at the very beginning of this season. And we're going to see that this has a very different flavor and a very different feel to it than where we were last week in Psalm 63. Let's read it together. Psalm chapter 142. You can follow along in the YouVersion Bible app. you got the scriptures right there on the screen, or you can always uh, use a paper one like this. So let's dig in. Psalm 142, verse 1 says, I cry out to the Lord. I plead for the Lord's mercy. I pour out my complaints before him and tell him all my troubles. When I'm overwhelmed, you alone know the way I should turn. Wherever I go, my enemies have set traps for me. I look for someone to come and help me, but no one gives me a passing thought. No one will help me. No one cares a bit what happens to me. Then I pray to you, O oh Lord. I say you are my place of refuge. You are all I really want in life. Hear my cry, for I'm very low. Rescue me from my persecutors, for they are too strong for me. Bring me out of prison so I can thank you. The godly will crowd around me, for you are good to me. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we love you. We thank you for your presence here right now, Lord. And I just ask you, Holy Spirit, to just let your anointing rest upon me and rest upon this time, this divine and sovereign moment we have to look at your word together. Lord, I pray that, God, your anointing will not just fall upon me, but, God, I pray your anointing will fall upon every single one of us. God, whether they're watching right now through Facebook, through our live stream, Lord, or whether we're gathered here today in person, Lord, I pray that your anointing will fall upon each and every one of us, God, so that we can hear, understand, and receive everything that you have for us this morning. In Jesus' precious name, I pray. Everybody said Amen. 
Uh, anybody ever watch MMA or boxing? Anybody ever get to fights? Ever watch the fights? You can see them on Fox sometimes. And uh, of course, you know, I mean, I remember coming up back in the day when I was a kid. Man, I remember, I remember, I remember Mike Tyson. You know what I mean? I remember boxing when it was kind of at its heavyweight heyday. Amen. Some of you guys are maybe old enough to remember boxing in the real heavyweight heyday of Muhammad. I remember, remember when you didn't have to pay for fights and you could. I, I don't remember that time. I do, I do. Uh, but I, I've heard stories of you know the ABC Wild World of Wide World of Sports and. You could watch Muhammad Ali fight George Foreman and, and, and all those great heavyweights back in the day. My day, of course, we're talking about uh, Evander Holyfield and, and Mike Tyson. I mean, I remember going to school the Monday after Buster Douglas knocked out Mike Tyson, and nobody could believe it, everybody. Okay, but of course, now today, uh, boxing is almost uh, a thing of the past, and MMA is, 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 is what we're all into. But, but if you ever watch those fights... <clears throat> I love uh, I love the ring I love the ring entry. The ring entry is probably one of my most favorite. One of my most favorite. That's I don't know if that's right or not. It's one of my favorite parts of watching the fights because you get the music comes out and and you get a little person you get a little taste probably into the fighter's personality by the music they have coming out too. But this is one thing you always notice about fighters, uh, whether boxers or MMA guys or any type of uh, combative competition sport. They always and this is one thing that's always amazed me and I, and I and I understand why now. But I would notice that when they come out of the line, locker room, they are all dripping with sweat. Anybody ever notice that? They're all sweaty. They all, they all look like they just got done working out. Anybody notice that? And I've watched that and I thought, man, what? that seems kind of like a waste. If it, you, you would think that you might want to conserve every ounce of energy you can before you go in to a cage or a ring with another big giant guy that's looking to knock your head off. You know what I mean? But there's actually the principle behind that. Uh, fighters call it blowing their first lung. What that means is, and if you've ever worked out or if you've ever done any running, you might notice it. How many have ever, how many have ever run? I'm a big runner. I don't know if you can tell, but I'm a big runner. I run all, no, I'm just kidding. I don't run at all. I hate, I hate run, running's of the devil. I don't, I don't, it's, uh, no. It's not the devil. It's fine. If you want to run, run. But uh, it's just not for me. Uh, <laughs> so, but 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 I have run in the past, and I, I mean I have done it begrudgingly. But uh, here's what I noticed about running: it, it, it's it's if you can run, if you can make it through that first like five to ten minutes all of a sudden you'll find your stride and you'll find your breath and you'll find your lungs, they call it. And then it's one, it, but it's, it's that first five to 10, 15 maybe minutes is usually that first one, sometimes two miles of running or jogging or whatever that you have to really push through that, the, the, that whole first, anybody ever experienced that before? That whole first, some of you are like, I've never run before in my life. I don't know what you're talking about. That's, that's fine. Uh, but, but sometimes you find this working out too. Sometimes in, you know, when you're working out or lifting weights, if, if, if when you start out, you don't feel like doing it. Your mind and your body is telling you, this is stupid, this is dumb, what are you doing? But if you can push through those thoughts and, and discipline yourself to push through that first lung, all of a sudden, you'll find your wind, and then you can keep going. You can just, you can just go. And you ask marathon runners, how do you, how do you run 23 miles in a, in a, in a, in a marathon? It, well, after they get past that first two or three miles, they, they find their stride, and they begin. Same thing with a fight. The reason they come out sweaty is because they... They, they don't want to come into a ring cold. In fact, they want, to, they want to actually exhaust themselves through that first lung, if you will, so that they're ready to get into the ring and they're ready to go. And that's a, that's a principle. And so, and so I shared that principle to say what we see here in David is sometimes when you're going through a cave season, Sometimes when you're going through a desert time, sometimes when you're in a place where you feel like nobody's there for you and, and, and God, God is, is kind of shut the heavens off and you find yourself in a circumstance that, that you didn't plan for, that wasn't in the plan, that, uh, that, and life is just kind of throwing you some curveballs and, and, and you're, you're maybe all, you feel like you're, you're going down and you're in a downward swing. What we see here is David is going through that. He's fighting through that first lung. He's, he's allowing himself to feel the emotion of the loss and the pain and, and, and complaining, and he's getting through that. Because sometimes, listen, you've got to get through that first push so that you can push through all the way out of the cave into your calling and into what God wants you to do. Amen? And many times, many times, 
We give up before we've even blown through that first lung. We give up before we've even pushed through that first place. And we, because it was so painful, it was so miserable that we're like, man, this is terrible. Why am I going to do this? And so you stop. And what you got to understand is what, what you really need to do is allow yourself to push through that so you can break through into the place God has for you. Amen, somebody? And so we see here David is getting through that kind of first lung, breaking that first sweat as he goes to this cave. This is probably something he's writing or feeling at the very beginning of this cave season as he's running from Saul, fighting for his life. You see here, you see here his emotional state. <clears throat> Verse 6, he cries out to God. He says, he says in Psalm 142.6, Hear my cry, I am very low. Rescue me. My persecutors are too strong for me. Bring me out of prison. So what's David feeling? He's feeling very low emotionally. He says he feels like he's weaker than everyone coming against him. He tells us that he feels like he's even in prison. He's saying, God, I can't do this. Look, look a couple verses earlier in verse 4. He says, no one gives me a passing thought. No one will help me. No one cares a bit what happens to me. I mean, that is David feeling the full brunt of his loneliness. He is is feeling the full pain of his season. He's feeling the full pain of his moment. I just want to say this. Listen to me very close. Um, there is nothing wrong with feeling emotional about some of the seasons that you go through in life. Amen? Let me just give you another little window into what is really happening here. Most people believe that we, we looked at Psalm 1 Samuel 22 last week, and it says that David writes this as he escapes to a place called the Cave of Adullam. Many people believe that that Cave of Adullam is probably somewhere in the vicinity of where David killed Goliath just a few years earlier. So I want you to imagine, put yourself in the position here, David is, David is literally hiding out in the place where it all started, in the place where he saw God bring such amazing victory. He's back around the same spot. He may even be able to look out of the cave and see the very field where Goliath fell and where he cut off Goliath's head. He's in the same place. However, it's a very different place. And it feels very different. And some people, wrongly and incorrectly, try to believe that having great faith means that you don't have any emotion or feelings. Or that because you're a person of faith, or supposed to have great faith, that that means that all of the feelings you feel should be happy and good and victorious and rainbows and sunshine and unicorns. But let me just set this straight here this morning. Listen to me close. Great faith does not deny feelings. What great faith does is it harnesses your feelings to allow those feelings to push you closer to God. Great faith doesn't say, doesn't just ignore and, and while you're dying and while you're in pain and while you're depressed and while you're having these thoughts that you can't make it, great faith doesn't refuse to admit or acknowledge that. What great faith does is say, okay, I feel like garbage. I feel like my life is falling apart. I feel like I'm weak. I feel like I'm in prison. I feel like no one cares. I feel like no one's there for me. I feel like I don't know if I'm going to make it, but I will take these feelings to God. And I will, great faith, listen, great faith doesn't refuse feelings. Great faith simply refuses to allow feelings to push you away from Jesus. Amen. So allow yourself in the cave to feel what you need to feel and go through what you need to go through. Just take it to God. Take it to Jesus. Amen, somebody? And this brings us to a couple of real practical steps that we see here from David's psalm of how to do that, of how to let our great faith or how to let faith 
push our feelings closer to God and not allow them to push them away from our calling and away from God. The first thing is this, verse one and two. David says, I cry out to the Lord. I plead for the Lord's mercy. I pour out my complaints before him and tell him all my troubles. Who's David complaining to? The Lord? Amen. Not your coworker? Amen. Not, not on Facebook? Not on TikTok or Snapchat or Instagram or whatever you, you're using now? I don't know. Not on any of those things. He's not writing emails to people. He's not blogging about it. No. He's complaining to God. Okay? Principle number one, listen to me. Complain to God before you complain to people. Let me say that again. If you're going to complain in your cave, let me just say it this way. In fact, I don't believe it's necessarily a sin to complain in your cave. But you need to complain to the right person. You need to pour out your troubles to the right person. You need to do it with the right attitude and the right understanding. And David says, I pour out my complaints to God. So if I'm in the cave, and if I'm feeling low, and if I'm feeling beat up, you know what I need to do? I need to put my phone away. I don't need to get on Facebook and start talking about how terrible my day was, and so that everybody will see how struggling I am, and maybe somebody will comment and like my post, and I'll know someone. No, 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 forget all that. Complain to God before. I'm not saying you never complain to people. We're going to get to that in a second. But before I complain to people, I need to take my complaint to God. David gives us the reason for it in verse 3. He says, when I am overwhelmed, you alone know the way I should turn wherever I go. Why do I need to complain to God? Because he's the only one that knows. Why would I waste time complaining to people who don't have an answer for me anyway? Well, I'm preaching this morning. <laughs> complain to God before you complain to people. Because he's the one that has the answer. He's the one that's got the wisdom. He's the one that's got the plan. He's the one that gave you your calling. He's, prob- he's even probably the one orchestrating and leading you through the cave, even though it's a painful process. So complain to him complain to God before I complain to people. The second thing is this, verse 4. He says, I look for someone to come and help me, but no one gives me a passing thought. No one will help me. No one cares a bit what happens to me. This is very different, David, than the giant killing David, isn't it? Like, when I read that, I almost read it with, like, a whiny kind of, like, tone. You know what I mean? Like, no one cares about me, God. Here, here's the problem with that statement. I love the fact, the Bible, you understand, the Bible is truth, but every, every statement in the Bible is not necessarily the truth. It is enlightening the truth. It is speaking to the truth, but God allows us to see some statements of David that are not necessarily true. 1 Samuel chapter 22, verse 1, we read that last week. What did it say? It said, David found refuge in the cave of Adullam, and it said all of his friends and family found out he was there and joined him. And yet David is saying that no one cares. No one's there. Wow. Right? Catch that? If you read that in verse 1, it said, When David went to the cave of Dolan, it said all of his family figured out he was there, and they came down to meet him there. But here he is complaining to God, and he says, No one cares. No one will help me. No one gives a, a, a care what happens to me. Okay? Here's our principle. Here's our principle. I need to recognize, listen now, I need to recognize when my emotions are exaggerating my circumstances. Amen. That's right. Amen. And then I need to fight and resist the urge to allow that to happen. Amen. Amen, somebody. When, 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 I, when I'm feeling down, when I'm feeling beat up, when I'm feeling at a loss, when I'm feeling like my enemies are overpowering me, when I'm feeling like I'm in prison, when I'm feeling like no one's there, 
it's, it's okay to, to complain to God. It's okay to have that feeling. It's okay to, to, to own that. But I also need to own and understand that emotions and feelings have a tendency to exaggerate the truth, not enlighten the truth. And so I need to recognize that, that I might feel like no one's there, but I also need to look up and go, wait a minute, is that the case actually? That's right. And if what, if what I'm feeling doesn't, if, if, what I, if what I'm looking at, if what I see doesn't line up with what I feel, then I've got some tension there and I need to resist the urge to allow my emotions to take me further into a place, further into the cave than God intended me to go. Amen? So recognize when my emotions are exaggerating the circumstances and resist the urge to do so. Complain to God, recognize that my emotions will often exaggerate, and then resist the urge to do so. When I do that, when I do that, I will begin to allow my faith to harness my feelings and push me closer to God. Amen? And then he says in verse 5, he goes on, after he's hopefully recognized his exaggeration in that verse 4 statement, he then says, I, I pray to you, O Lord. What do I do when my emotions are exaggerating? I better turn it over to God. I pray to God. Amen? And he says, I pray to you, O Lord. And then he makes this statement. He says, you are my place of refuge. You are all I really want. And we, we, we hit on this a little bit last week, and, and this, is a, this is a thread that runs through all of these prayers of David in the cave. Remember, David has been called and anointed by God to be the next king. David has spent the last couple of years, or the last few months at least, in the palace living the royal lifestyle under King Saul. And now he's in the cave. Now he's running for his life. And he feels like no one's there. And he comes to this statement of faith in Jesus. He says, you know what? You are all I really want anyway. See, the cave has a remarkable ability to keep the call in perspective. See, if my whole walk with God is just me following Jesus so that I will attain some great goal or so that my calling or my destiny or my whatever will be recognized in Christ. If it's all about, if, if I'm following Jesus just to move me from one place to the next, then I'm missing out on what it really means to follow Jesus. That's right. That's right. Because following Jesus is enough, whether I'm in a cave or I'm in a palace. Amen? I said this last week. Okay, whether and, and the cave has a way of of breaking all of that off and reminding me and letting us remember that you know what, God, it's not about the cave, it's not about the palace, it's not about the car I drive, it's not about how much money I make, it's not about me reaching the goal, it's not about any it is about you. And when Jesus becomes all I really want, when if I can allow myself I want you to understand, there's, there's nothing wrong with wanting nice things. There's nothing wrong with having nice things, as long as nice things don't have you. Amen. You understand what I'm saying? Yeah. And so the cave will allow that to come out of my heart. The cave will allow me to put that in perspective and remember, Jesus, I have you. You are my Jehovah Jireh. You are all that I need. You are my supply. You are my Jehovah Sitkanu. You are the Lord, my healer. Come on, somebody. Whether I'm in the cave, whether I'm in, whether I'm in the palace, Lord, I have you, and you were all I really wanted anyway. That's right. Amen. And David comes to that place, and then something amazing happens. And I believe, it, I believe that you see this in order. I believe when David gets to this place where he allows himself to say, it's okay, God, if it's just you and me in this season. It's okay, God, if it's just you and me in this cave. Then verse 7, something amazing happens. He says, bring me out of prison so I can thank you. And then he says this, the godly will crowd around me 
for you are good to me. Let me read you something in the next verse of 1 Samuel 22 that is, describes this time in David's life. I'm going to start in verse 1. It says, So David left Gath and escaped to the cave of Adullam. Soon his brothers and all his other relatives joined him there. Verse 2, watch this now. Then others began coming. Men who were in trouble or in debt or who were just discontented until David was the captain of about 400 men. David goes from saying, no one is here for me, no one cares about me, no one is here to help. But then when he comes to a place and says, Lord, it's okay, you're all I really want anyway. You are the prize, you are my portion, you are who I'm serving, you are who I'm going after. All of a sudden, God begins to send people David's way. And David says, the godly will crowd around me and they will, and, and for you are good to me. Listen, this is the funny thing about these people that God began to show up. Watch this now. These were the right people that God had for David's life and season in the cave. However, when they first showed up in the cave, the right people looked like the wrong people because they were in a cave of their own. The Bible says it wasn't, <laughs> God didn't send David an army. God didn't send David a bunch of trained soldiers. The Bible says everyone who was in debt or in trouble, <laughs> meaning they were running from something, or just simply discontented, just thought, you know what, what is this whole thing even about? What am I doing here? Those are the ones that showed up to David in the cave. However, David looked at him and said, these are the godly ones that God has showed up. The right people look like the wrong people. And I want to say a couple things. I want to say just a couple things about the people that show up and are there for you in your cave, that God brings you in your cave season. The first thing is this. Don't miss, understand this. No one looks like they are called when they're in the cave. Amen. Amen. David didn't look like a king. The people showing up didn't look like an army. However, God's call was on every one of their lives regardless. So listen to me. Don't look at, don't look at someone in their cave season and assume they're not called to be in your life or to have some God do something great in their life. Don't judge me by what you see in the cave. Look past the cave and recognize the call that's on my life. Come on, somebody. And I got news for you. You might not look like or feel like like you're called because you're in a cave God has a call and an anointing and a plan for your life so don't miss the call on someone's life because they look like they're in a cave What you'll find out as you begin to study David's story here is he as he does ascend to the throne later on throughout first and second Samuel is that these 400 men later became known as David's mighty men. They weren't mighty men when they showed up in the cave. They were struggling to pay their bills. They were unhappy about life. Many of them, some of them were fleeing probably from the law. They were in trouble, it says. And yet in the cave with David, God turned their situation around. Here's what happens. God brought them into the cave with David so that David could help them find their call, and then God used those people to help David find his call. They were the ones that became David's mighty men. You can see the stories about them. Some of them fought hundreds of men at one time. The Bible says there was one guy, I believe his name is Adino, Adino the Ezraite. The Bible says that the Philistines were attacking a, a, a place of land, uh, and it may be Shamgar. The Shamgar and the there's different ones. But, but the Bible says that they were attacking his bean field. The Bible says one day he had enough of it, drew a line in the sand, and says, you're not taking my beans no more. You may say, what's the big deal? They're just beans. Beans are just beans unless they're your beans. Come on, somebody. And he decided these are my beans, and you're not taking any more of my beans. And so the Bible says that several hundred men came against Adino the Ezraite, and he slayed so many of them that when the 
the battle was over, they had to physically pry his fingers open to get the sword from his hand. These are the men, this is, this is one of the men that showed up in the cave. But they look, the right people certainly didn't look like they looked wrong when they showed up. Let me say this other thing about the cave and the people that God shows up in the cave. Listen to me now. Don't miss this. The people God brings you in the cave are the people you'll be able to trust in the palace. Amen. 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 See, once you get to where God's called you to be, once you walk in your calling, once you walk in your anointing, once you walk in your destiny, once you get to whatever your def definition of a palace might be, once you get there, trust me, there will be all kinds of people trying to show up and get a piece and get a part of what God's doing in your life. Some of them are from God. Some of them will not be from God. It's going to be hard to tell. Time will tell. But those ones that showed up to you in the cave, come on, somebody. Those people that stuck by you when you had nothing, those people that showed up and prayed for you when you didn't look like you were worth praying for, those people that showed up and, and helped pull you out of the cave when you didn't know if you were going to make it, those are the people in the cave that you can trust when you get to the palace. Amen, somebody? Thank God for people that showed up to me in the middle of cave seasons. Come on, somebody. So don't discount and don't, don't, uh, don't miss the people that God brings to you in the cave. They're the ones that God that you can trust in the palace. They're the ones that David helped, that got, helped David discover his call. I, I just, I, I can't tell you how this happened in scripture, but this is, this is just in my head how I kind of imagine this story playing out. <clears throat> because David was a worshiper, and you got to remember that these are just, uh, I'm going to mute this now. A lot of these were songs David, David wrote, and David sang probably in the middle of this cave. that monitor right there, please. And in my, in my just, in my just own imagination, I just imagine David in that cave, pouring his heart out to God. He probably didn't have, he probably had a guitar or a lyre or some sort of, some sort of stringed instrument. Imagine David singing a song maybe like this. Oh God, be my everything, be my delight, be Jesus my glory, my soul satisfied, my Jesus. I can imagine that David singing that, playing that. And one of those people that are in trouble, discontented, walk by the cave around that time and they hear, they hear some, they hear this noise out of the cave, something they haven't heard in a long time, and they hear, they hear somebody singing about my Jesus, you said. And somebody walks by and says, man, satisfaction, that's something, something I haven't felt in a long time. What, what's happening in that cave right now? What's happening in that cave right now? I need, I need some of whatever's in there. And they show up in that cave to David, broke down, busted up, all dirty from life and all kinds of stuff that's happened to him. And they sit there next to David and they begin to worship together. They begin to have this cave moment together. Jesus satisfy my Jesus 
Jesus, you satisfy. I, just, I think this old song, I'm going to take you guys back to about the early 1900s, but this is just a cave song for me. Listen to, listen to this. When we talk about stripping everything away and letting Jesus be all that matters, this is what happens in the cave. This, this is that type of song. Listen to these words. Be thou my vision. O oh Lord of my heart, not be all else to me, save that Thou art, Thou my best thought, by day or by night. Sleeping, thy presence, my life. <laughs> Come on, why don't you stand with me all this place this morning? We're just going to worship for a moment, guys. Listen, I want to encourage you right now. If you're in the cave right now, listen, the way you get yourself through that, it's okay to feel what you're feeling. It's okay, man, to feel low and to feel like you're getting beat up. But, man, it's not okay to stop worshiping in the cave. Amen. So, if that's where you are, if you're identifying with that today, man, just let know these altars are open. We're just going to sing. We're just going to sing a cave song right now and just let the cave strip away everything else besides Jesus and let God know, God, it's okay. I wasn't in this for the palace anyway. I was in this for you. Amen, somebody? Let's sing that first verse again. Be thou my vision, O 